I'm just very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to answer all this. No, no, no. I've just got, you know, just a couple of general. I, I looked at a um, speech that you gave with, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this name. Uh, Howard Cole. He's not a legal uh, advisor to Hillary Clinton. Okay. Former and so, dean of Yale Law School. Right. So yeah. this was in 2002. Yeah. And, and um, this was a American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, at Cambridge. Yeah. And so he said, and I'm quoting Harold, he said, of course, we live in an age of globalization. But that age can now be divided into two discrete eras. The first, global optimism, that began as my Yale colleague, he said, John Lewis Davis had pointed out in eight, uh, 1989 with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And the second was the um, age of global pessimism, obviously, which began September uh, 2001, uh, September 11th. Now, do you think that these definitions still hold today? Well, I know it's a sweet it generalization. Well, I, I think there was a change uh, and the, 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 in, in, the, in the mood of the public. For example, the Patriot Act, which involved right. a lot of issues like surveillance, wiretapping, forcing librarians to reveal who A and B, what A and B read. Uh, that law passed about 70-30 or 75-35. And many liberal Democrats voted for it, including Hillary Clinton, which didn't do her good during the campaign. And that was a, a result of the fear of the pessimism, to use your word, the Howell's word. Uh, and there was a change now, as time went on, and we saw the extremes to which the Bush administration would go, and how many of these things were unnecessary, were not doing anything about the war, but people were very, in, in, uh, uh, not in, in, in a positive mood, and they were prepared to go along with the government. So I can say, to that extent, I, I agree with you. Yeah. The other thing, um, and again, it's a sweeping question, but the trade-off that we all have to look at, especially today, in terms of national security and civil liberties, and I think that's a, 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 you know, a place where we all find ourselves, where we want to defend civil liberties, and yet often when we're talking to other people who may not be members of ACLU. Um, Are there such people? <laughs> not, well, not that I know. <laughs> no. uh, but Stratton, of course, and and will say, now let's let's hear you defend the fact that we have to have. Uh, they'll say, you know, national security versus civil liberty. And, uh, you know, I can carry on for a while, well, but well, I'd like to... Well, it, that was a, a sort of the last point which I, I truncated yeah. somewhat. There are these two values. Yeah. And you, you have to get specific. Mm -hmm. For example, you say, is it is it right for national security to have the government wiretap mm -hmm. without some basis that they prove to a judge? Mm -hmm. Some people would say yes. Now the ACNU has to consider the national security issue as well as the civil liberties issue and, and tries to work out policies that do take account of national security. Now a lot of them, of course, are inconsistent with what a, a true believer of national security person would think. But you have to get specific. You have to say, should librarians be forced to give the list of books that or surveillance, should there be surveillance cameras at every corner? Now, some people will say yes, but uh, it, once they start think or torture, mm -hmm. and of course people would say, well, if torture is necessary, we have to do torture because <coughs> uh, secret which will save a thousand lives. But the evidence, again, I don't consider myself an, an expert on any of this, but the point is, that I know that many military experts have said that information gotten by torture is not reliable. Right. And that you know, when you're being tortured, you'll say a lot of things. <coughs> and uh, now, each, each case has to be looked at specifically. But the ACA would never deny that national security issues exist and should be taken into account. They would never deny that. One more question for me, and that is you just you were mentioning um, having 
having been in college in the 60s, I recognized a certain... No, not the, I, I no me, oh, me. Yeah. I recognized, when you were talking, I remember <coughs> Kathy Bodine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I was Is that the daughter of... Ah, the weather. She was in yeah. jail. But yeah. since you mentioned Kathy, you yeah. know, I don't know well, Leonard Boudin had two children. One Kathy became a yeah. member of the weather. The weather, yeah. And his other child was Michael Boudin, who was a Republican, part of the Reagan administration, <laughs> and was appointed by Reagan. He's now, he was until recently chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, which is in Boston, Boston, Maine, New Hampshire and Rhode Island, and he, he was a brilliant guy. He was Obama. The first time I ever heard of Obama's name was when a professor at Harvard Law School said, have you ever heard of Barack Obama? My answer was no. He said, you ought to keep an eye on him. I said, why? He said, you know, he was elected president, which is editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. Having been an editor of the Harvard Law Review, I can say, I know how, he, not, how difficult it is to be elected president. We've got some pretty smart people there who are not the passive in there, right? <laughs> but Mike Boudin was also the president of the Harvard University. And as I say, he worked for Covington and Burling on antitrust matters representing defendants. He married, a, a, married late in life, he married a Harvard Law School professor named Martha Field, who's very liberal. And people who know them better than I do, although I didn't know them, have detected a softening of his right wing <laughs> decisions. <laughs> <laughs>